Welcome to the second week of the political economy section of the EISPS core course. Today's topic is spatial models of politics. What does that mean? Well, I think if I asked you to place yourself or political parties uh, or candidates um, on some sort of left-right continuum, uh, um, I think most of you would sort of know what I mean by that and would have some sort of implicit idea of what kind of parties in the UK or maybe your home country are to the left and what kind of parties are to the right. And maybe you would be able to place yourself on this as well. And that's really curious, actually, um, that we that we use this sort of spatial terminology, more left, more right, um, to, to describe sort of very abstract sort of ideological preferences about how society should be organized. Um, and maybe some of you have even taken something like a political compass, uh, like this, these um, apps that you can find sometimes, um, or vote advice applications, for example, if there's an election in your country, um, where you can answer a lot of sort of policy questions, uh, ideological questions on your sort of values. And often, um, you know, what comes out of this is sort of a placement in its sort of two, one or two dimensional space. Huh? And often we think of sort of two underlying dimensions, huh? one sort of economic left right kind of dimension huh? from, I don't know, communism to free market capitalism. Huh? Um, and the other dimension we often think of is a sort of a liberal authoritarian kind of dimension where you have sort of the, um, you know, sort of very liberal values in terms of how people should live their lives um, to sort of more authoritarian uh, kind of uh, values uh, on the on the on the second uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of a way many of us sort of think often about politics um, without studying spatial models uh, explicitly. But it's kind of curious that we have this left right terminology. So where does the terminology come from? Well, the origin of this, like so many things, is, um, is basically comes from the French Revolution. Um, so in the first National Assembly, um, what happened was that sort of, you know, people sorted themselves in terms of the seating arrangement somehow. And basically to the right, from the view of the president of the assembly, uh, to the right, uh, you had the sort of the conservative forces, the, the supporters of the king initially. Huh? Um, and to the left, you had the more sort of radical forces. Huh? And um, that kind of... Uh, seating arrangement, if you want, kind of stuck through the revolution. And then was, in a way, it, it stuck and got exported to all political systems and all parliaments in the world. Um, so, um, you know, most parliaments are organized in this way, actually. And sort of if you ask people, uh, people sort of to, to think of themselves, how they think of themselves ideologically, many will sort of give you the left-right kind of uh, terminology very, uh, very quickly. And this dimensionality, this idea that there is this underlying space, political space, ideological space, um, forms the basis of what we call spatial models of politics. And we'll basically look at a couple versions of this um, today. So the first thing we're going to look at is the so-called median voter theorem. Um, and it basically says that whoever is located in the middle of the ideological space, if you think of the one-dimensional sort of left-right continuum, has a lot of power. Um, and we'll look at this specifically for the case of sort of smaller committees, say, um, or legislatures such as the US Senate or whatever. And then we'll see an application of that apply to the, to the current sort of US Senate. And the second version of the median voter theorem concerns mass general elections. Huh? Um, and this goes back to, um, uh, to Anthony Downs' 1957 book, An Economic Theory of Democracy. So let's look at the median voter theorem in the simple sort of easy to understand committee version first. When we think about sort of models of political competition, it often helps to start with a really simple version and then think whether we can generalize this version and test sort of assumption or what happens if we change assumptions, right? Um, so let's start with a really, really simplified, really, really stripped down version of political competition. Um, and the easiest way to think about the median voter theorem is using the sort of committee version of it, the committee uh, version of the median voter theorem. And this goes back to uh, black 1948. So let's assume there's some um, underlying dimension of competition. I'll say what it is in a second. And we have only three voters. Okay. Um, and the uh, the example we're going to use here is the minimum wage debate in the United States. 
Uh, so there's you know, one, many of you have I'm sure have followed sort of American politics over the last few months. And one of the sort of um, initial uh, initiatives of the Biden administration was to raise the minimum wage. What is it in the US at the moment? It's $7.25, right? And basically the question is sort of what should the minimum wage be? Now, you know, building a model like this for the whole Senate is kind of difficult. So let's assume that uh, that there's only three sort of relevant uh, relevant actors. Huh? So we start with a really simple version and then we generalize, okay? So um, let's say there's only three members that matter, um, and these are Bernie Sanders, who many of you might know is sort of a leftist. I guess I've kind of inverted the scale here, so he sits the most to the right, huh? so we should look at it from the other direction, I guess. Um, uh, so the most leftist senator here is Bernie Sanders, who sits on the right for us here today at fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, th that was his sort of uh, um, headline proposal for the minimum wage. Um, then we have another senator. Let's call him Joe. We'll say more about him later. Uh, and uh, he wants uh, eleven dollar minimum wage. And um, I um, couldn't find a Republican with an actual sort of concrete proposal uh, on the lower end. Um, so um, the guy you've already met, Friedrich Hayek, uh, maybe has to has to fly the libertarian flag here. Huh? And and um, you know, given his views, which you've kind of read a little bit, maybe in the in the um, uh, you know in the uh, article last week, um, you know, would probably be sort of libertarian views that he. There probably shouldn't be a minimum wage, according to him. Mm -hmm. um, so, with this information and a few additional assumptions, we can basically make point predictions for what kind of minimum wage outcome we would achieve. Uh, what kind of policy outcome uh, do we get here? Huh? And this is the essence of the spatial model. Huh? So, we have a one dimensional policy space, the value of the minimum wage, right? Um, and we have the voters, we know their ideal points. So what is their preferred policy outcome? Uh, and then we can think about one more thing. So basically for all these three voters, these are the only people that, that matter in this committee, for example. Um, basically we can think of a sort of, uh, you know, the, the value they attach to different possible outcomes. Huh? So um, their utility in a way is maximized um, at this Ideal point in this uh, in this dimension, and we move away as uh, we, it it you know reduces as we move away from the ideal point. So what would that look like? Well, um, let's look at uh, at uh, Friedrich Hayek. So if he was sitting in the Senate, so Senate is only three people: Friedrich Hayek, Joe, and uh, and and Bernie. Okay, um, so he would like no minimum wage, uh, and the higher the minimum wage, the lower his utility. Uh, so he wants, wants zero, and the further you move away from zero, the more his utility declines, and the less he likes the outcome, if you want. Hmm? So we're just modeling sort of their preferences a little bit, but it's really straightforward, I think. So he wants zero, the further away you move from zero, the worse it is for him, okay? Then we have, of course, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders' proposal was $15, uh, and Again, sort of the further we move away from this ideal point, this bliss point of $15, uh, $15 minimum wage, the lower his utility. Yeah? So if the minimum wage is really low, he doesn't like that, but clearly he has some sort of upper limit as well. So he proposed $15, not you know, $100. So uh, as a consequence, I think it also declines on the, uh, if we were to go higher. Um, and then last but not least, we have, uh, we have our friend Joe, Who's, uh, who proposed or wants a $11 minimum wage. Um, and again, sort of as you move away from, uh, from the ideal point, his utility declines. This is basically just a way to describe how much do they like these outcomes. They like the outcome of their ideal sort of outcome most, and the further you move away from it, the less they like it. Hmm. So what happens now? Uh, we can uh, we can think about uh, how this would uh, would play out and make a prediction. That's the beauty of the median voucher theorem. So um, let's say we live in this situation with these these three ideal points. What could happen? Well, for example, uh, Joe and Bernie, both Democrats after all, they could get together and could say, okay, we make a compromise. We say, you know, eleven and fifteen. Let's split the, split the difference. Uh, let's institute a thirteen dollar minimum wage. You know? So they could could agree, and there are two of them versus Friedrich by himself, yeah, one one voter. So they could vote for that, and that would be would be the policy outcome. Okay, um, but what could what could Friedrich do? Um, Friedrich, of course, knows that for 
show this is not the ideal policy outcome. So we could think about whether there is a space that opens up uh, basically for uh, Friedrich to make proposals that are both better for him and better for Joe. So what could uh, what could Friedrich propose? Well, Friedrich could basically propose a value of the minimum wage, say ten dollars, that is both better for him than the thirteen dollar sort of uh, Joe and Bernie deal, yeah? um, and it is also better for Joe because it is closer to his eleven dollar ideal point. So Friedrich could go to Joe and propose this, or we could think of it the other way around. Joe goes to Friedrich and sort of uh, you know place the two out against each other. Either way would work. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, uh, what would happen? Well, we have now a sort of a standing proposal of $10 minimum wage. What could uh, what could Joe do? Well, Joe knows that this opens up a space and he can go back to Bernie and basically say, look, Bernie, you know, I know you don't, uh, you really don't like the $10, right? This is really bad for you. Uh, this compromise that I've struck with, uh, with Friedrich, how about I'll offer you $10, 50 or something like this? And then you can go back to Friedrich and, you know, bargain with him again and basically he can play this game back and forth until the outcome arrives um, at his most ideal sort of point as uh, his his ideal point eleven dollars no? so through bargaining with these two parties on either side um joe in this case is able to achieve an outcome that is exactly his ideal point and any other point sort of to the left or to the right of of his ideal point would be defeated in a way because um, you know, there's there's Joe and a voter to the left or to the right who vote against uh, against it. Huh? So only arriving at exactly his most preferred outcome is what uh, what would be the the um, the result of this process. Huh? And this is the basic idea of the basic logic of the median voter theorem. And it is quite a powerful prediction. It basically says that the guy, whoever it is, uh, who sits in the middle of the distribution, uh, gets exactly their most preferred policy outcome. In our previous example, we just had three voters. So what if we have five? What if we have more voters? Um, so let's, let's look at this uh, second example. So we have five voters here, A, B, C, D, and E, and they are not distributed along the minimum wage proposal, but, but along some spending on some project or something uh, proposal. And like I said, this basically applies to all sorts of committees and all sorts of decision-making situations. Um, and um, so what would our prediction for the outcome be? Think about it for a second. If you picked C, you got it right. Sometimes students pick sort of between B and C closer to C or something like this, something that resembles to them more sort of the middle of the distribution. But that is not right, uh, or the underlying dimension, sorry. That is not right. The, 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 the thing that matters is the median voter's ideal point. Huh? So who's the median voter? Well, it's always the person who splits the kind of group into, into equal parts, into half, huh? into half. Huh? So C in this case has exactly two voters to the left and two voters to the right. Huh? So C is the median voter and C will get whatever she wants. Huh? And we can add many more voters without changing this sort of basic dynamic. And like I said, this result is known as the median voter theorem. Uh, um, and the version we've just seen is the sort of committee version. And the basic idea is that under certain assumptions, hmm, so there's one policy dimension, one only, yeah, uh, people have what I mentioned before, I think single peak preferences. Huh? So their preferences fall somewhere along this, this dimension. You know? And as you move away from their sort of ideal point, their ideal proposal, their utility de declines, huh? single peak preferences. Huh? So they prefer some point most, and as you move away from it, they like it less. Um, there's no abstention, so all of these voters vote. Huh? Um, and there's only sort of two proposals at a, at a time, and not many proposals voted on simultaneously in a way. Okay? Um, and if those conditions hold, the outcome will be the median voters ideal point. Huh? And any deviation from this would be defeated in a vote. Huh? And this is actually quite a quite a powerful result, and it sounds a bit like like a, like the Nash equilibrium, right? And it is a Nash equilibrium. So any position uh, to the left or to the right of C can would be defeated in a uh, in a vote. Huh? So the only outcome that is kind of a, an equilibrium prediction, if you want, is the median voters uh, ideal point. So let's look at a more realistic case study for the U.S. Senate. 